Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I really have to thank the organizers. Um, you know, but the, the person I see is, is Dave Kraft, but I'm sure there's dozens of people. I, thank you. Um, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and uh, today I wanted to talk about, I was asked to talk about the five, uh, uh, about old and new reactors. And when I got into it, I, I said, you know, there's five things that haven't changed in 70 years. And so I want to talk about uh, the five things that, in my mind, um, have not changed. Rather, we're talking about uh, the um, Mark I uh, reactors of Fukushima or the AP-1000s down in Vogel or now the small modular reactors. I think there's five things that haven't changed. Um, and, and the five things are, are, are secrecy and then um, subsidies. And both of those are, are sort of political. <clears throat> and then three mechanical things, and, and that's waste heat, the decay heat, and they're separate things, I'll talk about them. And the last thing is the pile of waste that's now 70 years, 70 years old. So, so first is, is secrecy. Uh, you know, this is a technology that was, that was born secret. And um, um, for, uh, for good reasons, back in 1939 and 1940, actually, 72 years of secrecy in a, in a, in a 70 uh, year pile of waste. Um, the, um, the, the, you know, the origins of this technology were, were created in secret. And I, and I think that mentality has actually uh, continued through, um, the, through these 70 years. Um, we see it, um, the, Kendra and I are working on the, the, the San Onofre plant. And um, an example of this secrecy, even today, is that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will go to uh, Edison and they will pass documents back and forth across the table. But if the NRC doesn't take that document home, they haven't taken possession of it and therefore it doesn't ever get into the public document room. So that's an example of this mentality of secrecy that has, that has Wound, wound its way even to uh, to today. Well, th that was a that was a big jump, but let's look at it a little bit finer. If you look at you know the the, the origins of the Manhattan Project, then morphed into the Atomic Energy Commission, and um, uh, of course we had the promote and and regulate concepts. But but more importantly, the, the Atomic Energy Commission was really focused an awful lot on on bombs. Um, one of my favorite books on the, on the 50s is, is a book called uh, The Day We Bombed Utah. And, and it talks about the, um, uh, uh, the, the test that went awry and, and, and dropped an enormous amount of radioactivity on, on, uh, on St. George. But more importantly is the dialogue with the, that, that's captured uh, in the Atomic Energy Commission um, uh, discussions about what the public should know. So the roots, of this, um, the roots of this secrecy go right back to the bomb origins of the, uh, of the project. And that in turn drives a related issue, which is, which is the, the topic of the nuclear priesthood. Now, um, and that's not my term, that's been around for years. I've heard a couple of people take credit for it. But um, we, one of the previous speakers spoke about it. There is a nuke speak. It's almost like, do we read the text in Latin so nobody understands it, or do we, do we let the public understand the, what's going on up here? Well, the, the NRC's approach is to, is to read the sacred text in, in Latin and preferably in a, in a private room. And the, um, the, uh, they would very much like for the, um, the priesthood, the NRC and the, the, the people that operate these reactors, to be the only ones that understand the language. Now, I'm speaking to you as a defrocked priest. Um, <laughs> I, um, I started in, in nuclear in 1970, got a reactor operator's license on a small modular reactor, Paul. That was uh, um, the ALCO re reactor. Um, if anybody can tell me what that stands for, I'll give you a, a, a free coffee mug. <clears throat> Since for the American Locomotive Company. And it was a locomotive reactor and it had 60 kilograms of 93% enriched uranium in it. 
which is, which is five bombs worth of nuclear, uh, nuclear fuel in a locomotive engine. Um, and, and now we're back to small modular reactors uh, yet again. Um, I worked my way up uh, to become a, a senior vice president. And I really thought the system worked until it didn't. And um, um, when I became a whistleblower, the, um, I went to the NRC and I expected that the NRC would, um, would exonerate me. Um, instead, the NRC took bribes from my employer and missed all of the things that I, uh, I had discovered. And this is where Bob Alvarez comes into my story. I don't know where he is here. Hi, Bob. There he is. <coughs> um, uh, Bob was on, uh, on John Glenn's staff when my, um, when my information made it to Congress and, and, and had congressional hearings. Uh, where, where John Glenn basically said, yeah, everything Gunderson said was right, and oh, by the way, you were taking bribes. Um, despite that, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission never, ever came to my aid. So, so uh, an example of when you cross that threshold, um, it, um, a, a very famous nuclear attorney said to me, um, when, I, when I crossed the threshold, I asked him for some help as a whistleblower, and he said, Arnie, in this business, you're either for us or against us, and you just cross the line. So um, enough for the secrecy and the, and the priesthood issues. That's number one. And I think um, um, you know, it's, it's people like me, it's people like Paul and, and other people in the room here that, that try to break that, that veil of secrecy. And um, um, that's, that, that's important, but very dangerous because it's very difficult to break. Um, the second is subsidies, and um, the, um, uh, th this industry is, a, is, is heavily subsidized. The Union of Concerned Scientists has said that um, the cost from a nuclear reactor would be about five cents more per kilowatt than it is if we had really taken into account all the subsidies. The, uh, it's called bus bar cost. And the energy that comes out of the plant is about five cents. And it should be 10 cents. In other words, essentially double because of the subsidies. Now, I said that I wanted to talk about five dangerous things. And why is the subsidy dangerous? And it's because that, that was deferred money. That money could have been spent on something else. It could have been spent on solar. It could have been spent on wind or a smart grid. But instead, we elected to put it into nuclear. Um, the net effect is that um, we've got a non-competitive source of power um, when subsidies are included, and, um, and in fact, uh, you know, the old safe, clean, reliable um, uh, mantra of the nuclear industry makes it appear that nuclear power is incredibly safe. Um, both of those, the secrecy and, the, um, uh, and the, the subsidies, are really driven by, by Congress. Um, we don't have a um, um, Democrats and Republicans when it comes to nuclear power. We really have, you know, Democrats and Republicans. There's really no, there's really no difference here, and um, they are essentially we have a pro-nuclear Congress, and um, until we effectively change that, um, the issues of secrecy and the issues of subsidy will be um, will be really, really difficult to handle. The the other three, I can go to my slideshow now. Thank you. All right, this is um, Nuclear 101, and um, uh, everything you need to know about nuclear power, but we're afraid to ask. There's, there's two ways to generate electricity. One is chemically. You know, you stick two different metals into an orange, and out comes electricity. And, and the second way is mechanically. By uh, Faraday discovered that if you put a, 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 a magnet through a wire loop and move it back and forth, you'll get electricity. And that was in 1700, and really we haven't changed that way of making power um, since then. Um, whether it's a generator on a bicycle, or a windmill, or a hydroelectric dam, um, we are basically turning a generator, and that's moving a magnet through an electric field. So we're dealing with a technology here that dates back at least 300 years. Um, and, and essentially nothing has changed. It's been improved, but nothing has changed. Well, within that subset of spinning a generator, some people decide to spin those generators with steam. And you can spin them with coal, burn coal, and you create steam. 
You can spin them with oil, burn oil, you create steam, gas, and then nuclear. Now, we seem to be quoting Einstein today a little bit. I wonder how many of these Einstein quotes are really Einstein quotes, but he has some great <laughs> ones. Um, uh, this one, I think, really, really speaks to the matter and, and gets to my point number three, that um, boiling uh, water with nuclear power is, uh, is, is one hell of a way to boil water. The, the reason is that nuclear fuel can't get too hot. A nuclear plant is much less efficient than a coal plant and much less efficient than a gas plant. So our most modern technology, our 70-year-old technology, is really only, um, it really has the technological disadvantages that we had with steam plants way back in the, the early 1800s. We, by someone, I think Paul mentioned 33% um, is, is the efficiency of a nuclear plant. A coal plant will be 40 or 42 percent. And what that means is per megawatt that comes out, about 40 percent more heat is dumped into the nearest river for, for a, a, if you're going to compare nuclear to coal. And then if you're going to compare nuclear to, to gas, it's even, it's even uh, more absurd. It's almost two to one on a, on a modern, high-efficiency uh, combined cycle gas plant. So we've chosen a way of boiling water that is the least efficient way of boiling water because we can't let the nuclear fuel get too hot. If it gets too hot, we have a Fukushima on our hands. Mm -hmm. So by keeping the nuclear fuel cooler, we wind up creating an enormous amount of thermal waste. Now, what does that mean in the, in the big scheme of things? Well, Indian Point runs 2 billion gallons of water through it every day. So that's a live, vibrant water that goes in. It gets heated up 40 plus degrees and comes out dead water. The, the other example is up in, up in Vermont, and this is from the, the Connecticut River Keeper. Um, he told me that um, uh, before Vermont Yankee was built in the 80s, they, they did a, a shad population survey. And the shad, um, there was about 70,000 shad um, count it in the river heading upstream. Um, shatter, they go out to sea and they come back every four years. Um, about 70,000 shad going upstream before the plant turned on. And now there's 16. Not 16,000, 16. So we've essentially decimated the shad population. Now, I've looked at it, and of course for my Yankees argument is we need nuclear power because it saves on global warming. Well, I, I, I did the calculations, and if you take, and, and yes, Vermont Yankee saves a little bit of CO2, and it's probably, if we take Vermont Yankee and decide to mothball it, the CO2 will raise the temperature of the earth about a millionth of a degree. But in the process, we save the Connecticut River. And the, related to this, I'm sure you've all seen the, uh, the, um, the, the part of the plant that I'm talking about here is not inside the nuclear reactor, but this waste heat that heads back out. We've seen in the last two or three years, um, plants have to shut down because there's not enough cooling water in the river. And uh, for instance, if Vermont Yankee, Vermont Yankee was running at 80% power for most of the summer because with global warming, the river got so warm and the river flow got so low that there wasn't enough water to, um, to remove the decay heat. Now, Dave Lockbaum has, has said it best. He said, you know, people are portraying nuclear power as we need nuclear power to make the world safe for global warming. And the answer is that that's the opposite. We actually need to eliminate global warming to make the world safe for nuclear power. <laughs> okay, um, so, that, so number one was, was the secrecy. Number two was this, the... Um, um, subsidies. Number three was this issue of waste heat. The, um, <clears throat> the other two relate to what happened here in Chicago 70 years ago. Um, a neutron hits a uranium atom and it splits. Now, what excited scientists at the time was that right here, an enormous amount of energy was given off. 
per atom, that chain reaction creates about a million times more power than burning uh, an atom of coal. So it, it looked like free and abundant energy, too cheap to meter. Now, what they didn't take into account was that and that. And that's the decay daughter products that are left behind. You know, I, I went to RPI for five years, and we never talked about those two. It was always about the amount of heat that you could get out of the initial fissioning. And then also the, the, the mathematical difficulty here, and the beauty of the math, guys like Slazard and, and Fermi figured this out and tried it out on the atomic pile. When you put one neutron in, you get three neutrons out. And the goal is to get one of those to hit another uranium atom. And the math on that, I'll tell you, it's very intriguing and fascinating. It took years of, of some brilliant minds to figure out. And that's what enthralled the scientists. And, and no one ever worried about this and this, the radioactive fission products. Well, if one neutron can split and create a lot of heat, then one of those three neutrons can then split and create a lot of heat and so on. We become a chain reaction just like happened here 70 years ago. And what's left behind are all these little grapes, the radioactive fission products. They didn't worry about that in Chicago. And, and frankly, we did not talk about them at, in, in engineering school. We were, um, uh, they account for about 5% of the heat that comes out of a nuclear reactor. So everybody's excited about the pop. That's 95% of, uh, of the heat. And nobody seemed to worry about the 5% <coughs> of, uh, of the heat that comes from these leftover radioactive daughter products. And again, it doesn't matter whether it was the pile here 70 years ago or Fukushima or the AP-1000. That's a fact of nature. There's no way that those uranium atoms split into daughter products and don't leave waste behind. It's not a chemical problem. We can't transmute this. Those products are going to stay and are going to be with us for centuries in the case of cesium and... and quarter of a million years in the case of plutonium. Okay, so the advantages of nuclear power is that you get an enormous amount of power for very little mass. And that's the old E equals mc squared. C is 300,000. So when you square 300,000 times 300,000, it's a whole lot of zeros. So there's an enormous amount of energy that comes out of this process. That's what intrigued the scientists. But what they really didn't spend a lot of time thinking about is that these radioactive daughter products remain physically hot for five years, and, and Bob was talking about 100 years for, for some of these radioactive daughter products. And then they also didn't talk about the fact that some of these radioactive daughter products <clears throat> remain radioactive for centuries. Okay. Um, this is example number one of radioactive fission products remaining hot after the chain reaction shut down. When the tsunami hit Fukushima, uh, the control rods fell in. The chain reaction stopped. There's no doubt the chain reaction stopped. But then the diesels failed and there was no way to cool the plant. So even though the chain reaction stopped, we had this. So turning a reactor off doesn't turn the heat off. And it can't. There's no, there's no um, uh, magic formula to change this on the AP-1000 or on the small modular reactor in Alaska. Um, this is with us and will be with us forever. So problem number four is what to do with that decay heat. And the answer is unless the electricity stays on, you're going to have a meltdown. Now, this is fascinating. The, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says the chances of a meltdown are somewhere around one in 100,000 per reactor year to one in a million. So if you do the math on that, and I teach math at the community college every Monday in Vermont if you want to 
you want to come by. Um, you put 100,000 in the numerator and, and 400 nuclear plants in the denominator and do that math, and that's about once every 250 years. Now, if you put a million in the denominator and, and 400 to 400 nuclear plants, it's about once every 2,000 years. So if George Washington had built 400 nuclear plants, if you believe the policymakers at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, if you believe the priesthood, we wouldn't have any nuclear accidents even through today. From Washington time to today, there should be none if you believe the probabilistic risk assessment. If you use their high end number, one in the million, you could, be, you could have built those 400 nuclear plants when the Parthenon was built, and you'd have no nuclear accidents. Well, we know there's been five meltdowns in the last 35 years. TMI, Chernobyl, and three at, at Fukushima. So you do that math, 35 divided by, by five is one in seven. So history tells us that there's a one in, once every seven year, once in a decade chance of a, of a meltdown. And the NRC is informing our policymakers in Congress that it's not gonna happen over the next 200 years. Clearly, there's a disconnect with the numbers. So the, the second part of that, so that's the, 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 these radioactive fission products have to be physically cooled for a couple of years. But then after that, they remain radioactive for many, many years. We use the term 10 half-lives. So for instance, um, cesium is just one isotope I happen to choose because it's in the news a lot, but it could be strontium or any of these. Cesium's got a 30-year half-life. So if you had a million atoms of cesium, 30 years later, you'd have half a million. 30 years after that, it doesn't go to nothing. It's half of the half. So you're at a quarter of a million, 90 years still, 125,000 atoms, until you get out about 300 years before you don't have to worry about the cesium anymore. Now that's, that's why when um, uh, we talk about Fukushima Daiichi, or, or for the Fukushima prefecture being contaminated, uh, this is not a problem that's going to go away tomorrow. This is going to wash down and into watersheds and then biologically be brought back up through the roots of the plant and de redeposited on the surface for 300 years. This is not a problem that goes away. The second half of this is, um, is, is what do you do with the waste? So I'm at number five. And We'll be done shortly here. Uh, what do you do with the waste? And the waste is the cesium and the, and, the, uh, and the strontium. And perhaps we can imagine something that we could build that would keep that out of harm's way for, for 300 years. But more importantly is this thing called plutonium. Now, plutonium is not a fission product. It doesn't come from splitting uranium. Plutonium comes when a, a neutron doesn't hit uranium-235, it hits uranium-238. And then that decays to, uh, uh, to uranium, that creates uranium-239, which, de which decays to neptunium and then quickly to plutonium. Within about two days, um, that neutron that hit the uranium-238 becomes plutonium-239. That's got a 24,000 year half-life, 24,000 and change half-life. And it's made in abundance. We talk about hundreds of pounds of this material per reactor per year, and we've got 400 of these reactors. Well, there's a, there's a movie I'm sure at least half the people have in this room have seen it already, and if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's called Into, um, Into Eternity. Um, and it discusses the problems of designing something that has, to, um, that, that has to secure a material for a quarter of a million years. You have to remember, the pyramids are only 5,000 years old or less. So we're talking about they have to last 50 times longer than the pyramids. And we think in our hubris that we can do that. Now, it's a twofold problem. Well, and everybody seems worried about how do we warn future generations that there's something here and they really shouldn't dig here. You know, language changes so fast. A thousand years from now, will we be speaking English? I doubt it. You know? So a sign that we put, you know, uh, stay away or some kind of a symbol that we put stay away 
might very well be misconstrued by, by uh, a future generation. And so there's a lot of academic debate about how to um, prevent um, uh, people from inadvertently stumbling on this stuff a thousand years out or 10,000 years out or 100,000 years out. So that's what into, uh, into Eternity focuses on. But there's another problem. And that's it. What if somebody wants it? I mean, here's the most dangerous material known to mankind that can make a huge bomb, and it's just down a couple hundred feet. What if a dictator comes in and wants to blow up the country next to it? Do you want to put a sign there? Maybe it would be better to let people forget that it's there so that centuries out, it'll be more difficult to find. So it's a, it's a twofold problem. Do we protect the man from the plutonium, or do we protect the plutonium from the man? Either way, I submit it's bad news. Well, do we really need to do into eternity in the future? I, I, and I submit to you no, and, and I think Arjun's presentation was, was eloquent on that. Um, but as, as activists, let me leave you with, with this quote that um, it's mine, uh, but you can use it. Um, and it's, um, <clears throat> it really encapsulates this issue, I think, really well, and I've gotten great responses when I've, when I've discussed it. And I said, <clears throat> we're seeing the cost of solar plummeting while nuclear is rising, Gunderson said. This is from a, a newspaper story about two weeks ago. Um, but I, I also added that I, I had seen the rebuttal that the sun doesn't shine in the day and the night. But I said, but if you believe that man can build a repository to store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years, Surely those same people can find a way to store electricity overnight. <laughs> now, um, so the five points were um, the, 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 the subsidies and the secrecy, and then the waste heat and the decay heat, and finally this issue of, of, of waste disposal. I, um, I, I Skyped my wife Maggie, who can't be here. She's recovering from a, a, a really severe fall and, and, and associated uh, issues, but, but uh, about a, a takeaway for you guys, and I have her takeaway, so let me get it. Okay, uh, so this is from Maggie, and I hope she's watching. I think she might be live stream. Um, Maggie's the founder of the company. Uh, Fairwind started in, 70, in 2003, and um, I came on full time in 2008. Um, uh, and, and she, like me, came from the nuclear industry. Um, uh, so she, anyway, she said, Fairwind's uh, mission is to educate the public and decision makers about nuclear power. Take out the rhetoric. Take time to tell people the truth in simple, clear language. Refer them to the sites with the facts. Don't use nuke speak. This is what Kendra was saying earlier. Um, people will be shocked when you tell them the truth. It shouldn't be a partisan issue. Um, some people may not believe the facts about radiation release, as you've heard today. Um, and, uh, you know, starting at mining, uh, I always hear, you know, no one ever died from commercial nuclear power. And, and I think, you know, our, our representative from South Dakota showed that that's clearly not true on the, from the very get out. Um, related to that is in, in talking to people, use today's technology. I was up on, on, on TweetDeck during the presentation, and I've only found four tweets this whole day from this group. Um, we're not using today's technology to get to the young people. I know, I watch my kids, I, I, I can track what my kids tweet too. It's a great device, by the way, for, for parents. But, um, and they'll be in a meeting and they're tweeting you know, 10 times an hour. So we're not using the technology. And I think that's really where Fairwinds has been able to succeed a little bit, is that we've better used today's technology to get the message out to people who really need to hear it. Okay, thank you very much. Wonderful to see so many of you still here, and I really appreciate your attention and patience. Um, um, I've uh, been asked to talk about uh, new weapons and um, proliferation. 
Uh, the uh, link between nuclear weapons and, and uh, civilian nuclear power, of course, has been there from the very beginning. And um, I dare say it's becoming, uh, it, it, well, in the past it was, uh, uh, in a sense, nuclear weapons which drove the civilian nuclear power. I think we're finding on the international scene that civilian nuclear power may be, in a way, driving um, nuclear weapons. So I want to talk a little bit about um, what we're up against now. We have a lot of old weapons sitting around. The legacy from the Cold War is really stunning. Um, since 1987, when the United States and the, and, uh, the Soviet Union reached a peak of 70,000 nuclear weapons altogether, we've reduced that to about 19,000, according to the Nuclear Notebook, which the Bulletin publishes every couple of months. 19,000 are deployed and stored nuclear weapons between Russia, mostly Russia and the United States. Now, in the last 25 years, then, we've made a lot of progress. Um, the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, a program which brought the U.S. and uh, R Russian scientists and engineers together, have dismantled a lot of those nuclear weapons, and we've stored many in arsenals. Part of the problem, though, we have is what to do with the dismantled nuclear material. Um, where are we going to store it? Where's the waste? Bob Alvarez is uh, you know, absolutely right. That's the military programs, which are really presenting the problems of waste storage. Um, and with the ratification of the New START Treaty in 2010, we're continuing to reduce those numbers. And that's good news. Um, that's very good news. Um, the uh, problem, of course, is that we've got more waste to deal with. I think this next administration, the next Obama administration, will likely come to an agreement with the Russians about continued work on joint dismantlement of these weapons. And I think there'll be continued unilateral moves, uh, informal reductions, maybe not treaty-based, but uh, the Russians certainly would like to reduce their arsenals. And, um, and in fact, um, our military would like to reduce our arsenals, uh, especially with the budget crunch that is coming along. Uh, with, there are also, though, uh, stores of new f uh, fissile material, uh, material that is, nu is uh, nuclear that can be used for bombs. That's what fissile material ma means. It's bomb making, nuclear bomb making material. Um, we haven't really come to a good closure on that. There's been an idea for a fissile material cutoff treaty. Don't you love the way that people talk about this stuff? Um, and, uh, and maybe it's because it's such an awkward title for a treaty, but in any event, we haven't gotten very far. Currently, the Pakistanis are holding it up, we've held it up, the Chinese have held it up. Uh, the point is nobody wants to stop making this stuff quite yet. Uh, Obama did, in, the last, uh, in his last four years, uh, come up with the idea of a nuclear security summit. We've had two of them, one in 2010 and one in 2012, where um, we've asked heads of state, he's asked heads of state to come and uh, talk about the need to secure all nuclear uh, fissile material. Um, that is um, highly enriched uranium that may be still being used in nuclear power plants. There are some of those. Um, uh, also uh, uh, re research reactors. There are 140 sites around the world, I think someone mentioned earlier, 140 sites around the world where we have uh, fissile material. There's a research reactor in Nigeria that I was, uh, uh, I was shown with great pride when I went to visit Nigeria. Uh, there have been in the Congo. There are really all over the world from this Atoms for Peace program. So we've got this stuff just fairly all over the world. So we talk about the United States and we have focused a lot on the United States, which is a great place to start. But we also need to think about what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, and what's happening in the rest of the world is um, not exactly a great site. The Russians uh, are enriching highly enriched uranium again for their nuclear powered submarines. And you heard just a minute ago about uh, Norway using those nuclear powered submarines uh, in the Arctic. Um, the Arctic is a great place. It's opening up from cl climate change and there are more submarines and more patrols going on in the, that Arctic. And that's where a lot of the Russian uh, submarines um, uh, hang out, shall I say. 
Uh, Pakistan is enriching uranium to build more weapons itself. It seems to be on a, on a weapons uh, race. And the U.S. is modernizing its own weapons, um, although uh, a new, uh, uh, the idea of getting new plutonium pits for our modernized nuclear weapons seems to be running into trouble. So that's great, and we need to work harder on it. China is modernizing its weapons, um, though uh, its policy of minimum deterrence uh, with its warheads decoupled, I think, means it won't be a huge driver of that. Um, so uh, we've got weapons being built and more of them being built, nuclear submarines. We've got lots of military uses still for this stuff, as well as the civilian reactors. Um, so I think it's good to be mindful of that as also part of the drawdown, if I can speak of a drawdown, of, of uh, nuclear material. And it's the fissile material that I still think is the most dangerous, um, both because it can be used in bombs and because uh, in plutonium, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's very dangerous stuff. Highly enriched uranium is you know, extremely toxic. Um, and uh, I think Bob Alvarez and others have shown how that's the case. There are some new potential capacities that are developing, and I want to mention two. One is the small modular reactors, and I'll talk, we can talk more about that. The other is the new laser enrichment process for enriching um, uranium called Silex. It's less costly than the centrifuges. It uh, uses less electricity to enrich, and it also um, has, uh, it, do, it, does, it gives off fewer chemicals, so it's less easy to detect. So uh, if you put that all together, uh, there's a much greater uh, risk of proliferation of all kinds of nuclear material, whether it's low enriched uranium or high enriched uranium. And if you've got uh, treaties where you want to verify stuff, um, Silex makes it much tougher. And yet the United States has, in its infinite wisdom, developed this technology. Uh, and even though it doesn't really need this capacity, it's been wanting to develop it so that it essentially can export it. Uh, it's been talking to Japanese, for instance, about whether they wouldn't be interested in coming in on this um, uh, new, new kind of, um, of enrichment facility. Uh, um, the, um, Again, Scott Kemp in July in the Bulletin has written a very nice article on Silex, which I think puts it all together for you. Um, a Silex plant would be 75% uh, smaller than a regular nuclear uh, centrifuge plant. Um, and uh, so it makes it much easier for, say, another country, like perhaps uh, copying Iran, uh, to make uh, of, uh, uh, enriched, ura enriched uranium, and it takes a much shorter time for the silex process to get from low enriched to high enriched uranium. So it's, a, it's something that, again, we've developed as part of our policy, which really doesn't have much use, or, uh, uh, and we need to keep paying attention. The small modular reactors we've talked about a little bit. Again, this is um, uh, something that can be, is a proliferation problem. Um, and uh, I think uh, we can certainly uh, come back to the Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission has just chosen uh, Babcock Wilson uh, to put in, I'm sorry? Wilcox. I'm sorry, Wilcox, sorry, has been chosen to uh, put a plant in Clinch River, Tennessee. Um, uh, Babcock Wilcox, as I recall, is the very same uh, company that provided the security at uh, the wide Y-12 plant that was broken into by the nun and her two accomplices. So um, go figure. I don't know quite about that, or what's happening there. Um, so what I really want to close with and emphasize is that the new nuclear power plants that um, countries are interested in, in developing, and <clears throat> China uh, certainly is going ahead substantially. It needs huge energy sources. It's also going ahead with solar and wind and uh, geothermal and coal. It's doing everything because it really needs it energy, they think, to bring their vast population uh, into, uh, out of poverty and into a better standard of living. Um, the most recent agreements, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, has signed an agreement 
uh, to uh, have a power plant uh, uh, built there. It's signed an agreement. They, they say they won't enrich uranium. Uh, so uh, at least somebody else, not the UAE, has control. But Vietnam has also signed uh, a contract, uh, this one I believe with South Korea, for its first nuclear power plant. Um, but it doesn't have this agreement to relinquish the right to fuel enrichment. Now the reason this is a problem, as you know from reading about Iran, is that uh, if you can enrich uranium for a power plant, you can also use the same technology to enrich it to make nuclear weapons. And the, the, the two um, motivating, uh, motivators for getting nuclear power now are energy sources and, you know, climate change is being used as a reason why nuclear is better than coal or oil or other things. But the other is because we think a lot of countries want to use it as a hedge. They want to have the capacity to have a nuclear weapon. It's still a motivating force. It's still something that drives countries. Um, Vietnam is on the border of China. Uh, there's no love lost between those two countries. Uh, we have not been able to successfully convince people and to provide the incentives for them to, um, to uh, turn away from nuclear weapons. So in summary, let me just uh, uh, kind of say, putting this all together, that um, the age of arms control and nuclear weapons reductions, as well as the Nuclear Proliferation T Treaty, uh, has, I think, been somewhat supplanted by an age of civilian nuclear power, starting with uh, nuclear power and then acquiring the uranium enrichment as a hedge so that you can make nuclear weapons. Um, so the, and the rules that have been brought, uh, that have been put in place, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty, um, have been somewhat effective, but the rules are not enough. And I think one of the things in the arms control community that we have uh, not really fully come to grips with is that it's nice to have laws and treaties and all that kind of stuff, but if you don't find the incentives to get people to do what the rules are telling you to do, there are always going to be people who want to break out, there are always going to be cheaters, there are always going to be people who want to, um, uh, you know, somehow get uh, underneath the radar screen. And certainly the U.S. has been one of the big rule breakers. Uh, let's uh, be fair about that. So with the ability to pursue this kind of ambiguous policy, you know, you don't, do you really want a nuclear weapon or not? Well, we're not quite sure. Uh, but the, the pursuit of civilian nuclear power then becomes a path to making a bomb. And I think in that case, the world still obviously faces peril from the spread of this most dangerous technology on Earth and the fire that won't go out. Um, in terms of things to do, I think there are probably um, a, a couple. One is just get smart and stay smart. And I know you people in this room are smart, and um, I hope you'll continue to look for sites. I'll plug the bulletin again, but you know, Steve Schwartz is here to tell you that it's the best, uh, best damn magazine on earth, except for Nonproliferation Review, which he now edits. But, but it's, uh, it's done, re it's really meant for people who don't know nuke speak. It's, uh, the, the whole idea is to get it into language without using uh, acronyms. Um, and I think there may be, and this is a smaller piece, um, I don't know this for sure, but the new chair of the Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission, Alison McFarlane, and we've cast great aspersions on the NRC today and probably with good cause. Alison comes at the job, she was actually on our board of the bulletin, she comes to the job as a geologist, uh, very skeptical about the ability to uh, uh, adequately store uh, the, the, uh, uh, the material from uh, uh, spent uh, fuel and, um, and has questioned many times. She's a leading expert on Yucca Mountain. She wrote a terrific book on it. And I think as much as we want to attack the NRC, we may actually have a friend there. And if there's any way that we can make use of her um, position, doesn't mean we you know, just, you know, kind of pander to her, but rather, uh, you know, as uh, FDR said, you know, I agree with you 100%, now go out and make me do it. And I think Allison's in a position, meaning, you know, make a lot of fuss, put a lot of pressure, uh, but I think she's sympathetic to some of what 
you all are about and we're about. So I'd suggest that this is really an opportune moment to pursue a, a, an anti-nuclear power, certainly an anti-nuclear weapon uh, uh, agenda. Thanks very much and we'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to take you up on that last point. Uh, Alison McFarlane uh, is now the chair of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Yesterday, November 30th, the NRC staff wrote to the commission asking them to put filters on the containment vents, these weak, you know, the Mark I containment is bound to fail. It was demonstrated at Fukushima, but we knew about it since 1972. That if it had an accident, it was going to fail. Uh, in order to uh, provide, you know, the continued operation of these failed containments, they decided that they could put vents on them that didn't work. But now the staff has arrived at saying, well, if we're going to let these things continue to operate, we better put radiation filters on those vents that we backfitted them with. That's going to, that went to the commission yesterday. The industry is going to oppose that. No question. No question. What's interesting is that the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists published in 1982 uh, Frank Von Hippel and Jan Bia wrote an article that said, you ought to put vents on these Mark Ones. Okay? So, uh, frankly, the bulletin is now in a very good position <laughs> to call upon Allison in her position, in her prestigious position as chair, with a copy of the bulletin from 1982 and said, your staff is now recommending this. 30 years later, after the NRC dissed these guys in 1982. So if there is an opportunity for reflection on change, illuminated by Fukushima, we need reasoned, we need reasonable people. You, you know, and I believe you, we've met, I've met Allison a number of times. She's reasonable. But again, she's in the context of regulatory capture. And it's a five-member commission. And the last one that bucked the commission, they rode him out on a rail. And that's the dilemma. Um, and Allison, you know, God bless her, she has put herself in the jaws of the beast. But she needs support. And I think the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists is in a very good position right now to, you know, I, I think that uh, didn't uh, Frank write a review in the Bulletin just months after the last, or after the accident yeah. in, in, in 2011. But the, 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 the thing that I wanted to just put back before you and, you know, if you have comment, I'm, I'm certainly interested. The NRC staff yesterday agreed with Jan and the bulletin from 1982. Are, are somebody going to respond? Oh, well, I didn't realize I needed to respond. I am. Um, you. Uh, you don't need to, only uh, if you want to. Okay, well, I, I you know, I think, um, you know, the, the Europeans, after, after that article was published, actually, uh, Frank, and Jan, uh, Frank von Hippel and Jean Bay's uh, piece, uh, the Europeans did put filters on the, the, the um, what are they called? Yeah, the Mark I, but the, yeah, on the, to, so, yes, they did. And we, our, our nuclear industry said, well, it would be too expensive. So cost, you know, always seems, to, the, the short term, you know, uh, kind of drives out the long term greater good in some ways. Um, uh, I think, you know, yes, Allison is one person 
And as much as she is, um, you know, a skeptic, you're right, she's going to be under a lot of different kinds of pressure. It's great that there, you know, her staff has recommended this, uh, but you're absolutely right, the nuclear industry is, is uh, you know, it's under even more cost pressure than it was in those days, so, you know, who knows what's going to happen. I think, um, uh, from just knowing Allison for, you know, a bit, um, She's somebody who I think will listen to a whole range of people. When she was on the uh, Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, you know, one of the recommendations that came out of that was to uh, involve the public much more in, in all of this. You know, they came and said, look, the storage problem is not a technical problem. It's a political problem. And the way that we go about talking and informing and engaging people in these questions, I mean, we're gonna have to store, is important. We're gonna have to, you know, if we shut all the reactors down tomorrow, we still have the problem of waste. So how do we, how do we deal with this? And is it, you know, it can be done, but we've gotta find ways to involve people so they understand the costs and the benefits. We don't want it sitting out forever, I don't think. It's a horrible problem, and we're going to have more of it if we dismantle nuclear weapons. So the question is, how can we reasonably, you know, go forward? And I, I think, but I do think we have a bit of an opportunity here. Uh, you know, uh, it would be worth talking st strategy. I think. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask Arnie Gunterson. Um, do you think that today's NRC staff is any more tolerant of whistleblowers um, to, today at nuclear power plants than in the past? No. <laughs> <laughs> is no, there any hope? <laughs> you know, I, I was, um, uh, you can apply to be on the advisory committee for reactor safeguards. So I did, I've done three times and I've been rejected three times. and. Um, the last time, though, uh, I, I heard a conversation out of, I guess by then I'd gotten hearing aids, so I could hear them a little better. And, and I, I was, uh, you know, I was invited to these 17 guys to talk about my credentials, and there was 10 of us and there was two openings, so I thought I had a 20% chance. And, and uh, um, so I said, you know, uh, I represent NGOs. And behind, there was this little stage whisper, that's a nice word for them. Yeah. Was, I, that's so a nice word. I think I'm sorry. it infuses. I need a hearing aid. What is it? Uh, that, that's a nice word for them. Oh, is what they the what, what I heard. And, and you know, so they, it is them and the anti nukes and um, uh, yeah, you've crossed the line and there's no going back. Uh, and I b truly believe that the staff is, uh, is is captured, especially I think that at the worker bee level. Uh, there's, there's good staffers, but as you work your way up in management, the higher up in management to go, you go, the more co-opted you are by the industry. Because there's really um, a wonderful whistleblower, Larry Crishone, who's at the NRC, yeah. in, on the staff now. And he's I get calls from whistleblowers, and for my first reaction is, don't do it. And the second reaction is, get a job before you do it. <laughs> and the third reaction is, if you've already done it, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> get a good lawyer well. uh, but it's not a uh, the process the whistleblowing process is not user-friendly hello uh, my name is Patricia Axelrod I conduct the desert storm think tank and all veterans advocate before I pose my question uh, and or make a comment I would like to introduce you folks if you don't know this good woman Ellen Thomas who's right over there. She runs Proposition 1 campaign for global nuclear disarmament and energy conversion. She's been working on this 30 years to try to bring about a nuclear-free world. So I want to acknowledge her. She really is a stu stupendous woman. And furthermore, uh, I'd like to honor Dr. Theodore B. Taylor, who, if he were alive, would be with us tonight. He was my friend and my mentor and a man of extraordinary intellect and brilliance and kindness and compassion. So I just want to say, Dr. Taylor, presente, as we used to say about, uh, you know, in that movement uh, as we struggled against the uh, struggles in Central America. But with that said, uh, I take note, Kenneth, uh, Ms. Benedict, that the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists this is dedicated to the risks of exposure to low-level radiation. And 
Uh, I'm primarily in some great measure concerned about veterans and about their exposures to what is euphemistically referred to as DU, something I'd rather call radioactive weaponry. And while the Department of Death, or DOD, whatever you want to call them, De Department of Defense, if they will acknowledge at all a health effect, generally they will dismiss it by stating, ah, oh, it's a low-level effect, therefore it has no consequence. And so, um, and I am very well informed, I'm bi-coastal, I'm in Nevada and I'm in Illinois. I'm very well informed about what's going on at the Nevada test site, which is a repository for low-level and bomb-grade nuclear waste. And I wonder if you could just very briefly give me a synopsis, <laughs> very briefly, if you could, if you could define low-level radiation very briefly, I know what it is, but for, the, for the, those who don't know, if you'd be so kind. Well, I think our, I should bring Arjun up here if he's still here. I mean, there is no safe level of, um, you know, exposure to radioactivity. Um, and I think the National Academy of Sciences has, over several reports, suggested as much. Um, uh, you know, it's always a matter of cost-benefit. Uh, mammogram, you know, I get much more exposure from that than from hanging around a nuclear power plant. But I'm willing to, to um, go through that in order to, um, uh, for health reasons. Dental x-rays, the same. So I think, um, th th yes, low-level radiation is, um, is something to be concerned about. But in, with all of these technologies in general, these are complicated things, and we need to be thinking about what the harm is, as well as, and the benefits. And, uh, you know, for each of us, if it's an individual thing, then we make that determination. Uh, the, be the problem is when it comes to uh, a public exposure to low-level radiation, and I think that's where um, it's, it's even more difficult, um, because it's not something you can control necessarily. Um, and it's something that you can't, it's hard to get a grip on. So that, um, the issue that we did in the bulletin was to an attempt to try to um, uh, tease out, untangle some of the complexities of the issue. Um, I will say, we, you know, we, we are <laughs> often sometimes called the voice of reason, sometimes we're not called that at all, but uh, I'll, I will comment that I got two responses, uh, several, but two in particular that I remember, one saying, well, I've read this uh, bulletin issue and it's really terrific and, and it's clear that we just, you know, there's just no safe level for this stuff and we should get rid of all of it. And the other one was, this is a great issue and, well, I guess we just don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> so it tries to inform you. So uh, be informed. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm John Bolenbaugh and um, I'm a whistleblower for Tar Sand Oil. Thank you. Um, I have turned into an activist now and a reporter and I make videos and they're becoming worldwide um, slowly. Um, but now I'm having whistleblowers contact me, one from a nuclear power plant in Michigan. I can't say which one, but I'm about ready to make some major videos of some major government cover-ups. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. So I came here to learn more about this, but um, I'm living um, an Aaron Brockovich situation in Michigan. We have hundreds and of sick people, and they're getting sicker all the time with seizures. People have died, cancer's on the rise. We had 40 miles of uh, river that was contaminated. And it's important for you people here in Chicago because they lied to you, and the toxic uh, chemicals made it to the Great Lakes, uh, to Mich Lake Michigan, and that's where your fresh water comes from. That's what you drink from. Mm -hmm. And so I want to know, because I heard today that it's radioactive, the bottom of our river is still full of oil, and I've already, from my videos, made them clean up over $100 million extra after they said a year and a half ago it was 100% clean from my videos. So can you tell me, thank you, can you tell me how radioactive tar sand oil is? Um, can you, I, I need to learn more about that, either from you or somebody later tonight that's in the audience. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm sure uh, somebody heard me, so it's just yeah, approach yeah. me later. The, uh, on, on the whistleblower thing, uh, two thoughts. Um, the, be very careful not to 
not to fingerprint the, the person. And by, even if you take their name off the file, um, that doesn't mean that there can't be retribution. I, I had a case where um, uh, uh, I made a mistake. A whistleblower contacted me. I, I totally sanitized the information. And I gave it to the NRC through, a, I always go, my, my, my wife's advice here is right on the money. Um, don't go directly to the NRC. Go to Congress and then have them give it to the NRC. It's, it, it's more protection for you and it also is likely to get results. POGO in, in Washington and there's also a couple others, uh, P-O-G-O, uh, something, on, on Program on Government, government Oversight. oversight. Um, can, can help whistleblowers. Uh, that would be one I'd go to. There's also a couple others down there too, but Pogo comes to mind. So I shouldn't um, just go through an attorney? Well, they, with would, this they would line you up with information. An, they would line the person up with an attorney, or if you called on the person's behalf, uh, whatever. But they'll, they're pretty good at not fingerprinting people, okay. and uh, um, they're also, uh, uh, they know how to work the bureaucracy. Yeah. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah. You know, I have a, one thought on your question about whistleblowers again. When I, when I blew the whistle, um, my wife and I went to the, the, the legislature in Connecticut and tried to pass a whistleblower protection law. And the first year we lost, you know, Northeast Utilities just overwhelmed us. But we, we, you know, it was okay because we educated a bunch of senators. The second year, we thought we won. And we had a great bill. This is in Northeast, uh, in, in Connecticut. And it, it was honest protection for the whistleblowers. But behind the scenes, Northeast Utilities took the funding away. So it's, it's not, you have to, as you're, from the, the person on the staff who was supposed to be doing whistleblower protection, they just eliminated the funding from that slot. So we, we lost, we thought we won and we lost. It's not, making a presentation in a state house is not enough. You really need a, a, a presence in a state house. Um, the groups in Connecticut, uh, in Vermont rather, have a full-time lobbyist and, and it took three years to, for what happened in Vermont. So one of the things I learned at the state level is um, you, you need a presence. When you walk out of the room, the lobbyists for the other side do not. I, I really believe you need bodyguards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's the only protection. And, and I, anytime I go do investigative work, I have uh, people that come with me now. So yeah. it's scary. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're running out of time, so I would ask all the questioners to be brief with your comments and questions and also the answers on the sta from the stage. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Beverly Walter, a local activist. Um, my question is about um, the Soviet Union. And um, <clears throat> after the former Soviet Union was dissolved, uh, it was broke. <laughs> and so they sold a lot of their weapons. And a lot of those apparently ended up in some kind of rogue nations that used to be a part of the Soviet Union. I think including a, a republic now called Moldavia, which is down close to Romania and close to the Crimea. And this <clears throat> is, is quite a rogue nation. There have been books written about it. And it is selling those weapons in a kind of a black market criminal fashion. I'm just wondering um, if you're aware of that and if you think that maybe any nuclear weapons have leaked out into the criminal element, the worldwide criminal element, because apparently it's getting stronger and stronger. I'm not aware of the, um, of the uh, these are conventional weapons that have gone to Maldives. Moldavia. Their was. weapons. I don't know if there were any yeah. nuclear weapons or not. That's what right. I'm wondering. Yeah, I don't. Uh, the the um, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, we worked very uh, diligently with the countries which were the inheritors of those weapons: Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. And in fact, uh, we're able to move those weapons back to Russia. Um, and uh, through another, de several different efforts have managed to move uh, much of the fissile material out of um, those countries. So I don't, uh, uh, yes, yes, the <laughs> Soviet Union, Russia was broke, and that's in fact why none, Senators Nunn and Lugar put in place the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, because they knew it would be difficult for them to dismantle and secure, and their, you know, their horrors 
stories about uh, where the material was kept and, you know, with a, just a padlock, for instance. So I, uh, we've, uh, over the last 25 years, have managed to secure something like 80 or 90 percent of the Soviet, or the former Soviet arsenals and material. Um, the IAEA does track um, uh, the uh, traffic in um, fissile material, either highly enriched uranium or plutonium, and um, there have been certainly a number of incidents, and it is scary. Um, uh, and that's why uh, we have worked hard to get Congress to continue to fund these programs so that they won't. But I'm not aware of, uh, there have been sting operations and there have been, um, there has been material um, that has been picked up, uh, but I don't believe that the kind of large scale operation you're talking about, I, certainly I haven't heard about it. Thanks. And one, one thing, I, I agree, there's no, I don't believe there's any missing nukes, the, but the, there are some handheld uh, weapons, you know, conventional weapons, that could poke the, si the hole in the side of a BWR fuel pool like Dresden and, and, and cause it to have a meltdown. So the, the conventional weapons are out there and, and uh, the, we as a country have discounted the terrorist threat issue. Uh, but it's also the case that the U.S. is the greatest manufacturer, the largest manufacturer of convention, of handheld, any kind of weapon. So it's ours. They're ours. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Hi. Thank you both for being here. Th my name is Gail Vaughn. And you had said, I believe you were quoting the NRC chairman, that the storage of the nuclear waste was not a technical problem, but a political problem. Maybe I misheard you, but no, something like that. Well, uh, I'm not so sure that I agree with that. I think that it's still something of a technical problem, and I wanted to know if anyone here has any idea of what we should be doing with all of the stuff that we can more or less secure, the spent fuel rods, the fissile material, the former bombs, much less the stuff that's out of control already, like Hanford and Savannah River and Fukushima. That's my question. Any, any ideas? Well, what are we going to do with it? I'll just quickly, I'm not an expert, you know. I'm just, I leverage my ignorance and try and <laughs> listen to other people and try and put it all together. But, uh, but uh, my understanding from, from the folks that I talk to at the Bulletin and other places is that, um, I mean, we do have to do something with it, right? Okay, <laughs> let's, let's stipulate that. Right now, the dry cask storage, as I understand it, um, has a possibility, and you know, you'll talk to the expert in a minute. But I think what Allison is refer was referring to was that the dry cask storage uh, seems to be sufficient for now. It's better than leaving it in pools, open pools. Um, and I think her suggestion is that Yucca Mountain may not be a, at all a good place from a geologist's point of view. But, but she suggests that there are places in the United States where if you're looking for a permanent repository, actually Illinois wouldn't be bad because, because if you look at the geology right now, uh, there isn't much seismic activity. It's a lot, it's very, you know, it, it's not, all I'm saying is that, uh, you know, we chose the West because that's where the weapons had gone off and people were used to dealing with the stuff. You know, we, there. The point is, we need to find a solution to it, and so. Well, I've given you the ideas that I know about, and we will be discussing that tomorrow as well. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. The the, you know, when you find yourself in a hole, the best thing to do is to stop digging. So building building more or running them longer creates more of the waste that we still don't know what to do with, and that's, I, I think, important. The dry casks you know, seem to be what we'll be stuck with for 50 years or more. Um, whether or not to keep those on the sites or to consolidate them is a separate issue, but getting the material out of these fuel pools, um, there, it would be, uh, to avoid a problem like Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4, which is a, all the fuel is in the pool, there's nothing in the reactor, and still the thing exploded. Um, we've got to get the fuel out of the fuel pools. And, and so our first priority has got to be to get it to dry cast. And on Yucca, Yucca was, you know, it was not, it was, it was chosen politically despite the science. And so people will say, well, you know, this is, this is a political thing and actually the science supports Yucca. No, it was the other way around. Yucca, the, the bill was originally called, the, to, to use the polite term, the Screw Nevada Act. And um, yeah, so Yucca may not be the right one, but some, somebody's got to take it sometime. 
But first, you got to stop digging. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, the last time I heard Jeff Patterson speak. He talked a lot about Alice Stewart, who was the person who did the original research on low-level radiation and its effect on the human body. And um, she said, uh, I read a little bit of some of the things she said, and one of them was that if a pregnant woman gets a uh, not a chest x-ray, a tooth x-ray, that uh, there's a certain percentage higher rate of leukemia in, her, in the offspring of a woman who has this while she's pregnant. And, uh, but I just wanted to put out the name Alice Stewart to answer some of the questions about the effects of low-level radiation on the human body. I Googled it, and it worked. You can find it. You can, yeah, you can find Alice Stewart's work in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and uh, we, the archives are on Google Books if you want to look it up. I'll just, uh, my name is Cindy, but just to follow up on that, there's a book called The Woman Who Knew Too Much that was written about Alice Stewart. It's her whole life. It's fantastic. Um, I just wanted to mention that we've been talking about a accidents. We haven't talked about waste accidents, starting way back with Chalk River, um, and then with windscale in England, it was so critical, this plant blew up that the, it was like a mini Chernobyl. All the milk and vegetables had to... Yeah, but it blew up. Yes, but then it was so bad that the, when they started reprocessing, which is one of the dirtiest places in the whole world, and when it hasn't been mentioned much to, once today, Sellafield, uh, which is making a reprocessing um, they had to change the name from Windscale to Sellafield, but it's the same place. Because they, they, they're very good at name changing when you have an accident. Not to mention in 1957, Christum. There have been three huge accidents in Euro Russia. One was Christum. I can't pronounce it very well. But one, they had all the waste in a lake, and the lake dried up, and the whole place just, there were three of them, not just one. Nuclear waste accidents. Not to mention Laguna down in Veracruz, Mexico where they have these nukes on the beach, and they're very bad in third world countries because they just dump the waste on the beach. I could go on and on, but I think we have to realize the seriousness of keeping these wastes in the future. And one question, what's the name of the plant that's going to shut down this year? Oh, uh, Kendra mentioned it. Next well, I heard year. a plant was going to... What? Kiwani. The, the Kiwani plant in Wisconsin oh, is... Oh, Wisconsin. Uh, it's a, it's a 600 megawatt plant. It's a single unit plant, and uh, the, the owner of the plant has decided that the, uh, it makes no economic sense to run it. So it'll be shutting down in. Uh, uh, you know, and and uh, we've said on a couple of the latest Fairwinds podcasts, we talk about that. that they're, the dominoes are starting to fall. These small single unit reactors, like Oyster Creek, um, Vermont Yankee, and, and others the commercial pressures on them to keep them running, especially in light of Fukushima modifications, uh, I don't think Kiwani will be the only plant to shut down. I think we'll see uh, quite a few. Also, I'd like to add that Canada, the, it, Quebec's only reactor, oh. Jean T. is shutting down by the end of 2012. Yeah. And that was new. That was a political decision made by the new provincial government. I'm Kevin Cotis from Muskegon, Michigan, and I think that we should uh, at least address, I mean, as, as a peace-loving person, we should at least address the fact that we are, we have to stop consuming so much. We have to demand more conservation of energy and not be lured and misled by the energy industry that we need more, more, more energy. Until we change our own behavior, nothing else is going to change. Uh, I'm Mo Headington, and I'm from Burridge, Illinois, in the western suburbs, and about Four years ago, I was somebody who mobilized along with uh, Dave Kraft, working with NEIS, uh, on the potential for argon being on a very short list for nuclear waste, uh, doing the research and development for nuclear waste reprocessing at Morris. And uh, I found it very effective to go to village halls, city councils, getting resolutions, explaining it to them, resolutions of opposition. We, we prefer Haas if, you know, given the choices that exist uh, versus transport. Uh, GNEP was the vehicle, and I know GNEP was zeroed out, but I also know that its name changed, and uh, the international framework on 
nuclear energy cooperation, I think, or something like that. And I Google it every now and then, notice that they still hold meetings, and uh, they have quite a following, because I think under Bush, 26 countries signed up and said, sell us reactors, and we were to take the waste off their hands. So I think that, I don't know if this has been brought up in any of these discussions, but it's not just our waste. I mean, it's everyone's, but if the politics are such that obviously the Bush administration's stand on it was adopted or he, we would have done the same thing, uh, Obama, because I think five or six more countries joined on. There's something like 31 of them, and then they have observer countries that are in the 30s or 40s for signing on to this. Can you shed any light on this international framework and where things stand with it? probably should turn to Steve Schwartz on this one. I'm not as well informed as I should be, but um, GNAP is not, uh, uh, it, yes, you're right, it's been zeroed out. I think, you know, there are continuing conversations, though, throughout the industry about how to meet energy needs. There is an international nuclear industry, and um, it, it, in this country, because of the market forces and the costs, um, there are very large pressures to uh, not build anymore. You know, it costs 12 to 18 billion dollars to build one. The small modular reactors are one solution to it, and in a way, I suppose that's a kind of, uh, you know, the, the uh, one of the uh, kind of remaining remnants from a GNAP. But um, but it, it continues to be an an issue, and, and it's great, you know, I think there's some uh, progress, especially if we can close some of the older reactors here, but, uh, you know, unless we've got international partners on this, um, I think it's going to be a continuing, continuing issue. It still is, a, to some, an attractive way of going. Yeah. Well, the partnerships seem to be one-sided, because we'd be taking the waste. <laughs> They buy well, the sure. reactors and right. companies well, again, and we take the waste. Right, exactly. Well, yeah. part of the issue is um, we don't want to continue to promote weapons proliferation. So mm -hmm. if there is, um, you know, weapons grade material or a thing, enough radio, enough um, uranium coming from those that can be diverted or reprocessed in a way that would, would make for a weapon, we'd rather not do that. So. It's an international problem. Uh, it's almost better that we take it back, frankly, than leave it there, in my view, uh, because I think we'll at least have the technology, and it's for some of the countries, uh, more wealth to, to manage it. So we can ship it out, but it may come back to haunt us. So, yeah. thank you. Hello. Thank you for being here. It's been a wonderful conference. I have a question that I don't believe pertains specifically to your expertise, but maybe someone else here can answer it. Um, over a year and a half ago, when Fukushima Daiichi uh, ex ex had this terrible disaster, uh, there was in the news, in the general media, reports occasionally about the extent of radiation fallout, both in the air and in the water. I haven't heard anything like that in over a year. And I have not seen any reports or any, even if any monitoring is going on to this day from that terrible incident. I know that, I, as I remember, there were uh, statements about the fact that our West Coast was affected. I don't remember the severity of those uh, apparent reports of how affected it was. Uh, and how much of that radiation contamination has shifted towards the east, even as far as this area of the country? Is anyone monitoring? Yeah, I can answer. yeah um, th there's a lot of this information on the on the Fairwind site. If you if you if you check, um, I um, I wrote a book on this, and it's a bestseller in Japan. So it's in Japanese, though. So. I <laughs> <laughs> it's I have not a Japanese friend. <laughs> um, you know, when, when the accident happened, the day the accident happened, I knew there was a meltdown happening. And um, this is the fundam one of the fundamental chain turning points in my life. Um, uh, I had been an expert on Three Mile Island, and I saw my government cover up that accident. Um, radiation releases were probably something on the order of 10 to 100 times higher 
than what the NRC will still say. In the and, and so I, I turned to Maggie and I said, you know, I don't care what it takes. I'm not going to let it happen a second time. And that's really when we put the videos up on the site and things like that. But so they, the, but the issue is um, the, the authorities, whether IAEA or the, or the Japanese government, have consistently underestimated the, uh, the radiation. I was in Tokyo in, um, uh, in February, and um, I, was, I was on the, on the book tour. And I brought plastic bags with me. And every day, I would walk outside and grab some dirt from where I was. And I ran those, uh, I came back with the, the dirt, brought them through customs officially. You know, you have to declare dirt when you bring it back. And then sent it to a lab. And all five bags would qualify as radioactive waste here in the country. And this was on the streets of Tokyo. So, um, you know, what, what we would have to ship to Texas and, and store um, by our standards in Tokyo was, uh, was ubiquitous. Um, the, the, um, I was there again in, in August, and I was over on, on Niigata, which is on the opposite coast on the Sea of Japan. And it didn't get nailed by the, by the plume so much, but the mountains between Fukushima Prefecture and Niigata are contaminated. And now their sediment in their rivers is loaded with radiation as well. Um, there, um, the, 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 in addition to the exposure people are picking up with their handheld inspectors and you know, the devices or Geiger counters that people have, um, there's, there's also a lot of hot particle contamination where people have ingested the material. Um, we have cases where we have house dust that we're getting, people are sending us vacuum cleaner bags of, of dust. And uh, um, one of the bags, which was examined over in England, it was um, 100,000 disintegrations per second in, in a two pound bag of dust. And that goes on, of course, for, you know, for centuries. So the Japanese sleep on the floor. So the dust that's on the floor is in their lungs. And, and I am at the, Based on my experience at Three Mile Island, I think over the next 30 or 40 years, we could see a, a million cancers as a result. I understand that that's an extreme view, um, but um, when you look at Steve Wing's work at, at TMI, um, I th and I extrapolate uh, linearly with that, um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of cancers. Right now, we see a, uh, an enormous, in, in Fukushima Prefecture, 40% um, of the of the uh, kids tested have thyroid nodules. The normal number is 1%. The thyroid nodules are a precursor for cancer. So we're at the beginning of that experience and it's alienating um, women especially and causing Fukushima divorces. We had, I could go on about this, we'll talk out in the hall. So you're saying yeah. that I can at some point in the future begin buying fruits and vegetables from California because over time, the current level yeah. of radiation will be not now, that we're at a point in the U.S. Uh, I'm, um, Seattle and uh, especially Seattle, but as far north as Vancouver and as far south as Portland, uh, got nailed in March and April, <clears throat> and we've got good science behind that. Uh, we had air filters out in Seattle in March and in April, and uh, they're called CAMPs, continuous air monitors, and essentially you pull air through a cigarette filter. And then you, every day you take that filter out, put a new one in, and then you roll the filter out and you put it in a, um, um, you, you lay it on an x-ray film. And uh, the people in Seattle wound up, and the rate at which the air filter was pulling air in was uh, 10 cubic meters a day, which is about what your lungs breathe. And we were finding 10 hot particles a day from Fukushima Daiichi during March and April for Seattle. So yes, Seattle got nailed. Um, Nowhere near what the Japanese got, maybe a thousand times less. Um, but um, but at this point, you know, it's washed into the soil, and I'm not worried about what's coming from terrestrial sources here in the states anymore. I'm um, I'm very worried about the uh, top of the line, uh, top of the food chain uh, fish that are in the Pacific, and I don't think that's peaked yet. Well, thank you to Kanet and Arnie for their expertise and to all the speakers today.